started when I, I published an article with the Stanford Law Review uh, 11 years ago. And uh, in one of the first debates on it that I participated in was, was in this room uh, in March of 2005. So this is an interesting, interesting venue to come back to. Um, so most of you probably know these things, but, uh, but to just briefly mention them, uh, the idea of mismatches is not an idea that's particularly tied to race. It's an idea that uh, students who uh, attend academic environments where their credentials are substantially lower than those of their average classmate will suffer a variety of harmful effects and applies to any type of preference, not just racial preferences. And in fact, it's been shown empirically to sort of operate in non-racial contexts pretty much the same way that, that it does in racial contexts. It's also not about affirmative action particularly. Uh, it certainly is related to the debate about the use of preferences in, in university admissions, but key types of affirmative action don't rely on the use of, uh, use of preferences. Things that are used to expand the pool or to rethink criteria for making decisions, some of which we talked about in the context of the last panel or two, uh, apply very much in the context of admissions and don't have anything to do with preferences per se. Um, so I think maybe the most interesting intellectual development in mismatch is uh, a growing awareness among those who work in the field that it really makes sense to think about first order versus second order effects. In other words, if someone is, is in an environment where their credentials are lower than that of their classmates, there are a variety of things that might fall directly from that. And then there are other things that are, are sort of more diffuse, more indirect. So the direct things are what I call first order effects. Um, and there are three types that I think have, uh, have had some significant purchase in the literature. One of them is learning mismatch. And that's kind of what we classically think about as mismatch, which is that if your classmates are better prepared than you are and the teacher sort of teaches the median student, then you may disproportionately suffer and you'll just learn less than you would if you went to a different classroom. Competition mismatch is different in some subtle ways. It's not the idea that you'll learn less, although that might happen too, but that the competition is going to affect your ability to survive. Um, so for example, in the science context, uh, if you imagine going to very competitive University A or somewhat less competitive University B, it might be the case that you learn the same amount in both places, but at University A, the competition is so, so tight that you end up getting relatively low grades. You get discouraged and you, and you drop out of your science major. Social mismatch is the idea that, um, that social interactions are also affected by levels of academic preparation. And that people are more likely to hang out with other people who have similar levels of either prior academic preparation before they get to a, a college or university, or uh, that they hang out with people who are performing similarly in that environment. That, get similar grades or you know, are stars or are struggling, that those things tend to mediate um, how people develop social interactions at college and, and professional schools. <laughs> Second order effects are things like um, college graduation or law school graduation. And they're second order effects because there's no direct causal mechanism that one would postulate between a mismatch effect and a graduation outcome. It has to be mediated by something else like uh, well, if I'm, if I'm mismatched in a school, then maybe I'll get lower grades because I'm learning less or because of the competition. And then that might lead me to not graduate at a high rate. Um, so because they're indirect effects, they're harder to measure. And a general problem with higher education literatures overall and mismatch in particular is that, uh, is that good data is often hard to get. So if you're using imperfect data and you're measuring an indirect effect, then it's very easy to miss the effect or to get a measurement that simply doesn't show any significant result. This is a, a nice example of kind of a classic mismatch finding. This is from a paper that actually appeared about the same time that I did my initial law school mismatch work by Smythe and, uh, Smyth and McArdle, two University of Virginia psychologists who looked at science mismatch. And this chart is showing um, the rate at which students who go into the sciences at very elite schools, the same set of schools that were studied by Bowen and Bach 
in the shape of the river, uh, actually end up graduating with a science degree. And so the center of the graph is people who have the same credentials as their classmates. So they would be at the zero point here. And the typical student at that point has a 1.0 odds of graduation. In other words, they have the typical rate of graduation. And what the lines mean here is that as your relative credentials go down, controlling for all your other academic and other characteristics that are in the study, which is a lot of other characteristics, your odds of graduating with a science degree go down. And as your relative credentials go up, your odds of graduating with a degree go up. So this, this, would, this might be a learning mismatch issue. It's probably more directly a test of competition mismatch. But the point is that it's, it's a pretty strong effect. These things really substantially reduce or increase your chance of getting a science degree. It's also notable that the bottom two lines on this graph refer to whites and underrepresented minorities. And the fact that the lines are essentially identical to each other underlines the general point that mismatch is not really about race. There's an interesting Asian effect that you know, we could talk about it in the Q&A or if we have more time. Um, but for, for most students, the, the race really kind of drops out of the equation. Um, so how do we look at these different mismatch debates? Uh, it's, it's often said, remarkably often, that they're really, you know, that the overwhelming weight of, weight of evidence is against mismatch. But if you look at specific debates, that really isn't true. So law school mismatch, for example, there have been dozens of articles written critiquing law school mismatch, but very few peer-reviewed articles. Uh, I think you know, we could say there are five or six now. Uh, four prominent ones are listed here. Um, there's only one article that's been peer-reviewed that actually finds an absence of mismatch effects. And that one, you can argue, really doesn't belong on the list because it really wasn't a test of mismatch. But several studies that have specifically tested mismatch and that have been published in top empirical journals have found very strong evidence of law school mismatch. So the weight of evidence now on, on this issue is quite overwhelming on the side that mismatch effects do exist and are fairly large. Um, science mismatch. Again, this is only a partial list. The studies of science mismatch are virtually unanimous, uh, either finding strong science mismatch effects or really not finding an effect, but almost always finding strong effects. There's no, uh, there's no study that I'm aware of that has uh, found that science mismatch doesn't exist. So you've got an overwhelming weight of scholarly evidence on one side of this debate. Um, academic mismatch hasn't been studied very much, but the one study that was done was by Colin Barber. This was a book that was commissioned by the Council of Ivy League Presidents, who were really concerned about the pipeline of, um, of minorities into academia. And they commissioned Colin Barber to do a really large, well-financed survey of, of about 8,000 uh, students and to try to understand what things kept people on academic track. And much to the dismay of the, found, of the sponsors, Colin Barber found that mismatch was a really important causal problem, that students who went to schools where they had a significant mismatch issue were about twice as likely to drop off the academic track as other students. Um, when they published their results, I mean, Harvard University Press had, had committed to publishing it, but the thing just kind of dropped like a rock under the sea. There was no further discussion about the issue. Um, social mismatch. Again, we've got a series of very strong studies finding powerful evidence of social mismatch. Um, nothing on the other side. There have been two randomized experiments uh, you know, the gold standard in social science, where you actually randomly assign people to treatment and control groups. One at the Air Force Academy, one in Kenya. You can argue the Kenyan uh, one is not, uh, is not applicable to American higher education because it's Kenya and it dealt with elementary school students. But it was a randomized study that specifically looked at learning mismatch and found very strong, very strong mismatch effects. So again, there's nothing on the other side. There's uh, two very highly regarded published in very top journals on the side, using experimental methods and finding strong mismatch effects. So um, if we look at any of the first order effects, the evidence, to, to call the evidence overwhelming is almost an understatement. Uh, 
it's, it's, it's so one-sided that it's hard to almost say that there, there should be ongoing debate about it, certainly ongoing investigation. But it ought to be pretty much a consensus finding at this point. On second order effects, the literature really is mixed. And there you get studies coming all over the map. And one thing that, that's pretty noticeable in the literature is that critics of mismatch tend overwhelmingly to focus on the second, second order effects and will frequently develop measures that are even more attenuated and more indirect than is possible with the available data. Partly, I think, because that makes it even harder to find significant results and easier to say that there's not evidence of mismatch. So I would concede that on second order effects like graduation, um, there's, uh, there's very mixed evidence. One of the most uh, striking developments in the field, and this is a brand new development, is the publication of this article by our city Akino and Lobenheim in the Journal of Economic Literature, which actually came out, well, I got my hard copy on Tuesday. Um, and uh, Journal of Economic Literature is maybe the premier place in the, in the social sciences where there's an effort to try to identify fields, especially controversial fields, and sort of assess the state of the knowledge. And JEL Commission, Arsidi Akino and Lobenheim, who had different starting positions on the issue of mismatch, to collaborate and develop uh, a diagnosis of, of what the literature said. They then took their draft article and sent it to seven peer reviewers to try to make sure that, that all views, at least within economics, were represented and reflected in the review. And then published it, lead article on the first issue of the year. That, this article finds um, very compelling evidence of mismatch in several areas, particularly competition mismatch in the sciences, very strong evidence of law school mismatch. They equivocate, equivocate more on the second order effect. Um, they didn't really frame this in terms of first order and second order effects, which I think could have made their findings a little bit more uh, easier to digest, but certainly found very, very strong evidence. And to the extent that they thought it was ambiguous, strongly said that we urgently need to investigate. We need to develop better data to try to convert the areas of uncertainty in areas where we actually do have greater confidence. OK. So that's the background. That's kind of the framework in which this is occurring. Um, now we're getting better data on uh, law school mismatch because we're finally able to get data about individual school outcomes. We've been handicapped by dealing with uh, broad categorical data where large numbers of institutions are grouped together. But through litigation, we have gotten several schools to disclose uh, distributions of bar outcomes by LSAT ranges and other sorts of information. And when you look at it that way, the mismatch effects are really overwhelming. For example, if you look at 153, 150 to 152, you see a 31% bar passage rate for first-time bar takers graduating from UCLA. Those are students who are very seriously mismatched at UCLA, but a 79% bar passage rate for comparable students taking the Arkansas bar. You might say, well, the Arkansas bar? But that, that's a pretty good comparison to California because it has almost the identical MBE threshold. It has a comparable level of difficulty to the California bar. When you look at this data, when you do regression analysis on this data, you find that the, the mismatch effect is even larger than the absolute effect of credentials. In other words, the effect of being lower than your classmates in LSAT scores is larger than the effect of uh, uh, than the effect of LSAT itself. So, if anything, past literature has significantly underestimated the size of the mismatch effect. So, let's go back now and look at the debate. Um, back in 2005, um, Stanford played a, a pretty important role in. Uh, in basically trying to persuade people that mismatch was a false issue. Michelle Dauber wrote an article making a number of inaccurate claims and claiming that, uh, that mismatch was essentially a fraud, analogous to cold fusion. Um, Dan Ho published an article in which he used an empirical test that would pretty much be um, obvious to anyone studying the area was not going to produce uh, significant results. He, he studied, well, 
I won't go into the details of it now, but it, it, it really was a study that I think was designed to fail. In 2017, Kramer uh, wrote to the State Bar urging them not to make available the data that, uh, that would really make it possible to do the sort of exact measurements and mismatch that we have in this data. Um, and he was part of a, a large number of academics who sort of came out, especially law school deans, who came out and essentially tried to persuade the California Bar not to make data available to study mismatch. Um, that, was, uh, that was successful. The Bar voted not to do a study, not to provide the data, and we've been litigating with the Bar since that time to try to get them to release the data. We're actually quite close to doing so now. They've, they've actually turned over the data to experts working for the plaintiffs, and uh, we're designing pr privacy protocols that I'm hopeful will be put into place before very long. Um, well, maybe I'll come back to Barnes in the question and answer. But if you look at the public discussion of, of uh, the debate about mismatch, you find statement after statement, especially in the wake of Justice Scalia's comments about mismatch in the December oral arguments on Fisher, where critics are almost very heavily disproportionately represented in the media, especially sort of the liberal establishment media like the New York Times, and invariably will say, there is no evidence for mismatch. It's almost a Dauber-esque statement that this is, this is just sort of a hoax. This is a, a fantasy that conservatives have about the existence of mismatch. And when you ask, sort of, sort of dig in and say, well, what's the kind of, where are they getting this from? The source that comes up again and again is the empirical scholars brief, which was a brief filed in the Fisher case. Um, uh, and it was, uh, there were three Stanford professors, these three, who played important roles in, in developing that brief. Um, what's striking about the empirical scholars brief is that it ought to be sort of the best brief statement about what's wrong with the mismatch theory. It ought to be sort of the most cogent response because it has eight very eminent co-authors. And when you look at the individual claims in the empirical scholars brief, they're all demonstrably false. So one of their big methodological claims is that, um, is that in the law school mismatch literature, we only use um, interracial comparisons. We compare, we use blacks as a surrogate for affirmative action and whites as a surrogate for the absence of mismatch. And you can argue that what you're really measuring is a, um, is a racial effect and not a mismatch effect. Well, William's article in particular has 30 different models, all of which are interracial. So the statement about his, his research is, is simply descriptively and wildly incorrect. Um, they argue that Sander and Williams adjust not only for pre-existing characteristics, but also for outcomes. This is a somewhat more subtle argument, which is sort of, in looking at bar passage, they're only using graduates. They're not looking at uh, sort of students going all the way through the law school process. But Williams actually talks about this issue in detail. So does our city Okano and, and Lovenheim in their literature review. And they're not only highly aware of the problem, but they sort of introduce very sensible tests for measuring it. And they're able to measure it directly. And they find that it doesn't make any difference uh, that both ways you produce pretty much the same mismatch effect. So I don't want to go over time, but the basic point here is that there's, a, there's kind of a pattern of not just bias, but sort of outrageous falsehood over-the-top statements that I think would not survive in ordinary academic discourse if there wasn't sort of this very strong ideological component. But in the context of affirmative action, in the context of sort of the racial overtones of the mismatch debate, these things are, are not only sort of passed over, but, but praised. You know, authors get lauded and rewarded for making these sorts of arguments. And we have, um, you know, a pattern of, of complete inaction by the legal academy. Not only, if, not, not only a failure to sort of address mismatch issues, but a complete unwillingness to even investigate, to even appoint a panel that will look into things and gather data and systematically consider it. So that, I would submit, is a strong case study for the, strong, the powerful and pernicious effect of political correctness on academic research. Thank you.
Okay, great. Well, I think there's obviously a lot we could talk about just about that, but maybe we'll get Nick's ideas on the table as well and, and then move forward. So you want to? Sure. Uh, great. So I'm glad to be here, and I think this is uh, among the most important sorts of things that the Federal Society does. So I'm very glad that we're doing this and shining a light on this topic today. Um, I'm going to, uh, you, you've gotten the empirical facts earlier today. I'm going to talk mostly anecdotally, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of how some of this uh, plays out. So you've learned some of the empirical facts. I'll just tell you at uh, Georgetown, our faculty is, we have 125 professors, and our numbers are, our ratio is 123 to 2. So I'm one of the two. And uh, I think that, um, and that's extreme, but um, actually the ratios are similar at a lot of uh, top schools. I think that might be the most extreme, but only by a little bit. Um, so, and you've also heard a bit about what some of the pernicious effects of this sort of imbalance uh, on earlier um, panels. Um, and if you want to read more about pernicious effects of this, you could take a look at Heterodox Academy, which John Haidt and I and others um, founded a few months ago. And uh, we've collected a lot of literature about this. You might want to take a look at that if you like. But OK, so there are a lot of pernicious effects, I think. But I'm going to talk about really just uh, one, which is I think um, you do get a bit of an echo chamber effect in these uh, schools because there is uh, no one to dissent. And the uh, thinking can get a little bit mushy. And in particular, I want to claim it actually makes these great elite law schools, these great elite law faculties, actually startlingly bad at the predicting of actual American law. What's going to actually happen in a uh, courtroom or what kind of arguments are going to persuade an actual American uh, judge? And so for that, I'm going to just offer up a few examples. My first one is Rumsfeld v. Fair. So in this case, uh, you know, uh, the military wasn't allowing uh, homosexuals, and schools were responding by, universities were responding by not allowing military recruiters on campus. And the Congress responded to that by saying but something called the Solomon Amendment, saying um, if, you, if you don't allow military recruiters on campus, then you don't get any federal money. And a number of schools uh, filed suit and uh, wrote briefs about this. And uh, Georgetown joined as well. So the Georgetown faculty joins this uh, fight. Many top schools signed on to this. And I'm confident Stanford was one of them. Um, and uh, I was you know, new to Georgetown and really just starting out and didn't, wasn't really ready to pick a big fight about this. But I did actually take one of the organizers of this movement aside and say to her, um, I, I don't think we should do this. I don't think we should actually sign on to this brief. And she said, um, I understand completely. You must have deeply held religious objections to homosexuality. And so that's, I understand your position about this. And I said, um, no, actually, I don't. In fact, I'm in favor of gays in the military as a matter of policy. Um, what I have strenuous objections to, though, are dumb legal arguments. And this is uh, not making any sense, this brief. And it's, um, not, it's embarrassing for the Georgetown faculty to be signing its name to these arguments, these legal arguments. And first, she, was, she seemed really quite shocked by that, just shocked by the thought that the, um, one's legal analysis and one's policy answer might be different. And maybe that's the the, the conflating of the politically correct answer with the legally correct answer. So she seems kind of surprised by that, but you know, I think she and really the rest of the academy was kind of shocked when they lost at the Supreme Court 8-0. 
Uh, so these great legal minds, of Stanford and Georgetown and so forth, and they convinced nobody, zero, right? Not Stevens, not Ginsburg, not Breyer, no, nobody, zero. So um, an example of just kind of startling blindness about what kind of arguments are going to work in court, kind of blinded by the kind of politically correct exigency of the issue. OK, so that's example one. To uh, um, the uh, Obamacare case. So one of the primary architects of the argument about, so the argument about Obamacare was um, Congress, can Congress commandeer you, require you, to go do something, right? to get off your couch and go buy some insurance, that was new, right? Regulating of inaction under the Commerce Clause. If you simply sat on your couch, you'd be in violation of this law. You were obliged to get up and go do something. Could Congress do that under the Commerce Clause? That was the question. And my colleague, Randy Barnett, said uh, no. Congress can't do that. Congress has never done it before, unprecedented. And Randy said he couldn't do it. What I want to emphasize here is that was that that view was not um, to say that my colleagues didn't buy that would be to understate it. Um, that view was really met with uh, ridicule, basically, um, not just at Georgetown, but kind of throughout the academy. I mean, just not taken seriously, considered to be outside of the legal mainstream, off the wall. I think was uh, a popular uh, phrase, and again, I think kind of dumbfounded consternation when that view actually turns out to win 5-4 at the US Supreme Court. Whether or not you think it's right, whether or not you think it's right, that's actually how it came out, 5-4 at the court. And that was not the view of the academy. And again, I think their prediction and their analysis of the quality of the argument a bit just driven by the exigencies of political correctness. So. That's my second. And then my third example is uh, a bit more uh, personal. So it's about Missouri v. Holland. Um, in uh, Missouri v. Holland in 1920, um, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes held that uh, if we enter into a treaty, then uh, Congress, uh, and the treaty promises that Congress will do something, then Congress automatically gets the power to do that thing. So, or to put the finest point on it, a treaty can increase the legislative power of Congress. Congress didn't have power to do something yesterday, but now we've entered into this treaty, and so now Congress does have the power to do that very same thing, Justice Holmes said in 1920. And he said it in a five-page opinion with no reasoning at all. He just asserted it. And that has been the, you know, that was, has been the conventional wisdom since then. Um, but he offered no argument at all, zero. But then there was a very um, uh, influential argument made in support of this claim. It was made by Lou Henkin, who was an extremely prominent um, professor of international law. Uh, and he wrote the sort of definitive treatise on this. And he said, I've looked at the history. I looked at the uh, drafting history on this question. And here's what I found. The Constitution actually used to say this exact thing. An early draft said, Congress shall have power to enforce treaties. Said that in the, in, um, the Necessary and Proper Clause, Congress shall have power to enforce treaties. And they cut that language as superfluous um, in the final draft. And that's about as strong as an argument from history can get, right? A, we know what the draft said. And B, we know why they changed it. They changed it because they thought it was superfluous. And so the implication clearly is, we should read the final draft to incorporate that idea. So Missouri v. Holland was right. That was hugely influential. He wrote that in his treatise in the 1950s. I looked at this issue, and I thought, it seems wrong to me. The conclusion seems wrong. But then I read the Henkin argument, and I thought, well, that is actually very compelling. I mean, hard to argue against that. So I thought that must actually be right, except I just thought, I'll just take a quick look at the source documents that Henkin cites for that proposition. And I had a look at the actual um, drafting history, and it just turned out to be uh, false. It just simply was not so that the draft had ever said that. He Now, I don't say that he was lying. He um, uh, misread it. I mean, there was a plausible way to have misread the history, but simply did not. The, the 
the Nestor Pop Girls actually just never said what he said that it said. Um, so I uh, wrote that up and I published that in the Harvard Law Review and um, Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas adopted it in um, Bond uh, just a couple of terms ago. But so the point of this story, did I, had I done some incredibly you know, nuanced parsing of history that nobody else was capable of doing? Obviously not. It was extremely easy to do what I had done. So why was I the first to do it? And the reason I think is the Lou Henkin conclusion was very congenial to the Academy. The Academy likes that conclusion. They like the idea of congressional power, and they like the idea of international law. And so to them, it all seems right. They read it, and it intuitively to them seems right. So it doesn't occur to them to check, flip open the uh, source documents. To me, intuitively, it seemed wrong, and that's why I opened the book. And I think the, you know, the, the um, converse thing could easily happen to a conservative, right? I could easily read something and say, oh, it seems right to me, and I wouldn't check, but a liberal would check, find out. So the claim is not conservatives aren't capable of these errors. The claim is just this. If a liberal makes an error like that, it's likely to persist for a generation, decades, for a long time, because there's no one around who has the instinct to check and see, is this maybe wrong? I had the instinct to check, it was wrong, but there had been no one around to look until uh, me. So these were, I mean, these are examples where um, the, the legal wisdom gets uh, perverted, as it were, by the monolithic ideology of the uh, legal academy. So, you know, I guess those are my few little hypotheticals. You know, and maybe I'll just, I don't know, I'll tell maybe one final um, anecdote, really just because we are here at uh, Stanford. I published those, I published that article in the Harvard Law Review. Then I published three other pieces here in the Stanford Law Review. And I came out here and I had a great uh, I was invited to visit as a visiting professor here at Stanford, and I had a terrific visit here. And I really enjoyed it. And I thought the place was great. I really enjoyed hanging out with everybody here. And I have to say, in particular, loved hanging out with Pam Carlin, who I have a huge amount of respect for. Had a great semester here and thought, this is you know, actually a terrific uh, place. Um, but I did not actually get a job here. Um, not notable at all. Lots of people don't get jobs here. Nobody has a God-given right to a job at Stanford, so not an interesting anecdote, except I can tell you that when I did receive the phone call giving me the news, the official word on it was, we've talked it all over here, and the verdict is, we do not need someone of your methodology here, period. Uh, close quote. So, you know, I actually give Stanford kind of credit for um, can candor as to this. <laughs> but at least in this one case, we don't have to guess. We know, actually, methodology does drive these decisions sometimes. Um, I'll stop there. OK, great. Well, why don't... <clears throat> so maybe Professor Carwin will offer some responses, and then we can have some debate. Yeah. Sure, great. So I, too, want to thank the Federalist Society for uh, including me in the panel. Uh, it's a really interesting topic, and I apologize that I wasn't able to attend the morning sessions, but um, I was teaching then, uh, so I, I know I missed some of the discussion. I'm coming in a little late. I thought in my remarks today I would talk about political correctness in the classroom and then political correctness with regard to research and then turn to the issue of political quest, political correctness in the relationship between the academy and the world. And I think it maps on nicely, um, although it's going to toggle between the comments that the uh, comments of the two of you, uh, comments about what the two of you have done. Uh, but I think it maps on nicely to what we've uh, heard from um, uh, Rick and Nick. Um, I feel like I should have a name that is like <laughs> sick. <laughs> or, you know, click or something. We'll work on it. Um, so I, one of the things that I have a little difficulty in discussing political correctness with is political correctness to me is a term that's come to seem a little bit like judicial activism. It's a term that's always used to describe uh, the positions uh, that the other side takes because the other side is judicial activism. We are principled. Uh, 
and you see that all the time. And the same thing I think is true of political correctness. Um, it, it's normally viewed as a kind of, as I understood it, um, as a sort of set of arguments that point to what I think of as almost the parodic behavior uh, of young people trying out arguments for the first time and super odd identity politics arguments that I think don't actually describe what goes on in most of the academy, although there are obviously uh, parts of the academy that are like that. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about what I had understood from the kind of description of the panel was going to be one of the issues, which is political correctness in the classroom and what does, what does that mean for uh, folks. And here um, I think there is um, a tremendous importance in creating open environments in classrooms where students can discuss what they honestly think about the cases within, in law schools, the context of the fact that we are a professional school and we're trying to train people to be lawyers as opposed to uh, a school of political philosophy uh, or the like. Um, and so it involves, I think, a responsibility on the part of the instructor in a classroom to make it clear uh, what the instructor thinks, but also to make it clear that students who disagree with that will be respected and will be supported in their arguments so that you really do have a diverse discussion uh, of the issues. Um, I sort of take um, as, my, um, as my kind of background point here, um, and I think about this all the time when I try to teach, um, the lines from uh, Learned Hand's uh, speech on the spirit of liberty, where he says that the spirit of liberty is a spirit which is not too sure that it is right. Uh, the spirit of liberty is the spirit which seeks to understand the minds of other men and women. Uh, and I think that that is a really important thing um, for uh, students to experience. And just again, anecdotally, since we're all sharing our personal experiences here, one of the reasons that I did not teach constitutional law for the first 10 years after I started teaching, even though I had litigated constitutional law cases and I was very interested in it, was that I had had Robert Bork uh, as my constitutional law professor. And he was a phenomenal law professor. He was smart, he was witty, he was quick on his feet. But he gave me no equipment that enabled me to feel that my views of constitutional law had any legitimacy at all. I came out of that course not understanding that there actually were arguments in favor of substantive due process, that there were arguments about why Griswold against Connecticut might be correct. Uh, and I did not feel until I had been teaching for a good long time that I understood how to teach a class in which students who disagreed with me would learn the tools they needed in order to make the arguments for their commitments when they went out there in the world. Um, so it is not just the case that liberals silence conservatives in classrooms or the like, but it's equally true that conservatives can make it hard for liberals to learn how to make the arguments they want to make. And in case you haven't yet figured out, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the liberal uh, on, on the panel. So we think it's very, it's very important to create classrooms in which students listen to each other and they're respectful of each other uh, and in which the instructor keeps the classroom a place where everybody feels uh, valued and respected. Uh, that being said, um, there are obviously huge difficulties with this, especially when you deal with issues that are of particular salience to the students outside the classroom itself. That is, you seldom see really bitter arguments about the tonnage clause, um, if you even know what the tonnage clause is. Um, I very seldom see really bitter arguments in my classroom or students feeling very uncomfortable when we're discussing the 11th Amendment as opposed to, for example, when we discuss qualified immunity. Or I don't see much in the way of students uh, being uncomfortable when, uh, for example, we discuss uh, the mathematical formulas for deciding contested elections. But I do see lots of um, angst in the room when we discuss issues relating to voter ID and the like. And so I think some of what instructors have to do is to avoid making students feel either that their arguments are illegitimate because they're politically correct or because the instructor disagrees with them. But I think we have to recognize there's disagreement. 
So let me turn now to the research point. And here, um, the striking thing to me, um, uh, both about Rick Sanders' uh, work and Nick Rosencrantz's work is, whatever you think of diversity or the lack of diversity in the academy, they have both been extraordinarily successful academic entrepreneurs precisely because they have made arguments that are new and different. And so you get rewarded for those kinds of arguments in the academy. You don't get punished for those kinds of arguments. Now, I can't assess whether Rick is right or his critics are right on the empirics. That is not something I have expertise in. Uh, that is not something that I'm capable of making a judgment on. What I do know is there is big disagreement about this among people who are all highly credentialed <coughs> and very smart. So the idea that there is an overwhelming consensus one way or the other strikes me uh, as unlikely. The difficult question here, though, is not whether there is, in some sense, with regard to some issues, uh, a problem of mismatch. I think, at least within the legal academy, as I understand it, everyone agrees that there are students whose prior preparation means they should not be admitted to particular selective law schools. The real argument is often over where that line is between students who would benefit from showing up in a particular law school because even though their numbers are lower than the median or lower than the 25th percentile or the like, and those students who wouldn't benefit. And here it strikes me as a very difficult issue, in part because I think ultimately the second order issues, which are less determinate, may be the more important ones. That is, uh, if you'll remember back to Rick's slides, he points to a slide that talks about the social, the first order social mismatch conditions. Frankly, in the great scheme of things, I don't really care whether students are in study groups that are mostly made up of people with the same entering credentials they have or not. What I do care about is what our graduates look like out there in the world, how they deal with legal issues out there in the world, and where people are 10 or 15 years down the road. Because law school is going to be, in some sense, a disorienting, painful experience at some points for almost everyone who attends it. And that's much less of a concern for me than where students are down the road. Uh, so it's very hard to know that. The second, th that is, at, at what level do we care about the students? <coughs> the second difference, and this is one that those of you who are libertarian or anti-paternalistic in particular should be asking yourselves about is, anyone who gets to law school is smart enough to read Rick's article and to understand what his basic argument is. That is, there's nobody who's coming to law school who isn't capable of just reading the article in the Stanford Law Review and understanding what its basic argument is. So presumably, the students who are the victims of mismatch are capable of reading that article and deciding they'd rather not be mismatched. They're capable of deciding, instead of coming, say, to Stanford, where I might be near the bottom of the admitted class with respect to my GPA or my LSAT score, I can go to, uh, you know, I'm not going to name a school because it's admit weekend and you never know where the admits are and you certainly don't want to end up on the ball. But I can go to, let's call it the, you know, the not Princeton School of Law because, as you know, Princeton always, when they do these surveys, people rank Princeton Law School very highly even though it doesn't exist. Perhaps they rank it very highly because it doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, I can go to the university of a state that barely exists school of law instead where I'll be at the top of my class. And so it seems to me, if Rick is right, that isn't necessarily an argument that schools should cease what they're doing. It's an argument that students should make that decision for themselves. And you know, the fact that legacy admits seldom say to themselves, I would be much better off going to a much worse school than my parents went to, even though I got into my parents' school, is a sign of a kind of revealed preference that, that many people have. But my basic point with respect to uh, the research piece of this is that mirroring the conventional orthodoxy does not get you published in the Harvard Law Review or the Stanford Law Review or the like. And so the incentives in the academy are not for you not to say what you believe. Um, they are for you to make claims that 
I have rethought the entire field, right? The, the perfect title to a law review article is Rethinking, Taking Everything That Happened Before Seriously, colon, A New Approach. <laughs> um, and that is how people get their reward in the academy. So it is no surprise that they publish, you know, it is no surprise that all sorts of articles that attack whatever uh, people think of as the liberal orthodoxy get published in highly selective law reviews. Because uh, writing an article, and this is actually a more general point in the academy that I think is deeply problematic, is trying to replicate other people's research. Or an article says, Lou Henkin was right, and nobody's said anything about it since he wrote it, that article would not be published anywhere, right? And so the reward structure is entirely about challenging whatever the orthodoxy is. And to the extent that we've had a long period of a kind of consensus liberal view in the law, you should expect to see lots of rewards from conservatives who attack it. Um, now let me turn to the last point, which is about the relationship between uh, law schools and the world, uh, and the two examples uh, that Nick gives of uh, the Rumsfeld against Fair case and then uh, the Affordable Care Act case. Rumsfeld against Fair. Nick claims that the problem here is that law professors are bad predictors of what the Supreme Court will do because of their overwhelmingly liberal orthodoxy. I think there are actually two other issues going on in a case like Rumsfeld against Fair, neither of which involves that. The first issue is that many of the people who teach in law schools today are, quite frankly, not good lawyers. They weren't hired because they were good lawyers and litigators. They were hired because, for example, they were great at uh, ancient law. So they're right, you know, they, I, I teach the history of Greek law, and that's why they're hired. They were legal historian. They're not particularly great at, at doctrinal analysis. Or they were hired because they do really interesting kinds of empirical scholarship, but not because they're really good at reading cases. So there's a whole group of professors I would not hire to represent me in anything. Right? I mean, if I were in trouble, uh, I would call a real lawyer to represent me. I would not call somebody who practiced for a year somewhere uh, and then went into the academy based on his or her PhD in a cognate field. The second thing, though, that was going on in Rumsfeld against Fair, and I was not surprised that uh, the side that I would have liked to have seen win this, that is, the right of law schools to uh, keep their non-discrimination policies and apply them to them, I, I was not surprised at all that the law schools lost that lawsuit. Now, why was I not surprised about that? Um, in part, I was not surprised about it because we were in a post-9-11 world. Uh, a post-9-11 world in which military recruiting is important. Uh, I and this is just raising an army, and they could come onto your campus and raise an army. Uh, Congress could order this regardless of whether they're giving you funding or not. But the real reason why law schools felt the need to litigate this point, and this is an important point for you to understand if you're going to go out there and be lawyers, is sometimes you have to litigate even if you think you're going to lose. And the reason you have to litigate even if you think you're going to lose is there is something important you are signaling either to the world or to your client. And the law schools were signaling to their lesbian and gay and bisexual students that they valued them and they took seriously their non-discrimination policies. And even if they were going to go to the Supreme Court and lose the litigation, that was something important to do. So it was not that everybody you know, dropped to the floor in shock when the case was decided the way it was, but it was an important case to litigate anyway. Uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, issue. This is a sign. Um, and I should say, on the Affordable Care Act issue, the, the last Federalist Society event, uh, national-style Federalist Society event, as opposed to a local Stanford-only thing that I appeared at, was the student convention. I think this is about four or five years ago. And I debated Randy Barnett on the Affordable Care Act. Now, again here, I am not surprised the Supreme Court did what it did, because the Supreme Court is a very political institution, and I was not surprised that they divided 5-4. The question is not, you know, were people shocked about this? I think the question is instead, uh, how do you read prior Supreme Court opinions or the like? And 
the Supreme Court had, until the Affordable Care Act, really not enforced the limitations on the Commerce Clause very much. They'd had a little hiccup in the, in the mid-1990s in the Morrison case. Uh, but then they had gone back to essentially seeming to allow all sorts of tiny little jurisdictional hooks and like. Uh, and therefore, it was not a super, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you would ask the most lower courts about this, I think most lower courts would not have decided the case the way the Supreme Court does. Because the Supreme Court is a different kind of institution. And so part of what I think it's important as law professors to do is to teach our students that the Supreme Court, unlike lower federal courts, is, to, it's good to be king, right? I mean, they can decide the cases the way they think the law ought to be, as opposed to trying to figure out where doctrinally is the law before they act. So I'm not surprised the Supreme Court decided the case the way it did. I would be uh, equally not surprised if, had the Heritage Foundation's version of this plan gone into effect in uh, 1993, when it was the conservatives who had this view of how to solve the health insurance crisis rather than the liberals, this court would have upheld the, uh, the, uh, the uh, individual mandate on Commerce Clause grant. Commerce Clause grounds. So understanding that the Supreme Court is political means understanding also that it's not uh, a liberal or a conservative orthodoxy that's at issue there. Um, and I think I'll stop there. OK, we have great. For well, <laughs> well that's, that's great. I want to give both Rick and Nick a chance to respond. I mean, I think maybe one place to start is with Rick drawing off what Pam said. I mean, couldn't we suggest that your experience is, is actually suggests that political correctness isn't such a big issue? I mean, you've, you've or in other words, the university is working, it's performing its function of providing a platform for people to challenge orthodoxies, present critical <coughs> arguments, because you've been able to advance a thesis that does challenge orthodoxies, conventional wisdoms, and not surprisingly, you get a strong reaction. And also, not surprisingly, given the way of the world, um, even if your view, what may be the best view of the empirical facts does not necessarily shape ultimate public policy. And this would hardly be the only area where um, other considerations um, end up prevailing in terms of public policy. So what, what's, the, what's the concern in terms of political correctness in the way debate is being limited on this issue? Great, thanks. And thank you, Pam. Very good comments. Um, first of all, I just want to make clear you're not the only liberal on the panel. Uh, I'm uh, pretty much everything I do except for mismatches is, is orthodox liberalism. And I was a uh, very early Obama supporter. I was a community organizer in Chicago before Obama got there. And Were you born I, in Kenya? I could go on and on. No, I wasn't. I wasn't. But I survived Indiana, which was almost as impressive. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't. I don't have complaints about my career, but if you look empirically at sort of how the law school mismatch thing evolved, it wasn't, there wasn't a reward system. Uh, the first thing that happened after my article appeared is that I was asked to resign from the, after the JD study conducted by the American Bar Foundation. I was, I was pretty much the informal leader of that study at that point, so that was not a trivial decision for them. Uh, but they felt that it would be impossible for them to get funding from the mainstream uh, legal academic institutions like LSAC and uh, and NALP, if if someone who had written the article I wrote continued to be a member of that panel, and they were they've been very careful to screen out any possible duplication of politically incorrect research. If you look at the other research that's come out of the after the JD, it's it's all <laughs> every single conclusion that's appeared is incredibly predictable. So uh, so that could have been a big blow to someone if they were counting on that as, uh, you know, for, for the other people, that, that will, probably would have been quite devastating in the career. It wasn't, it wasn't really to me. I was doing other stuff. Um, let's look at the number of top 20 law schools that had faculty colloquia about this paper. Certainly it was the most discussed paper of 2005, I think we would agree. So usually papers that are even fairly obscure but, you know, achieve some intellectual prominence lead to colloquia all over the country. There were zero uh, top 20 law schools that had a faculty colloquium about my paper. What do you mean by a faculty colloquium? I'm trying to figure out. Cause faculty we've colloquium? Yeah. I mean, we never have had in the entire 18 years I've been here a faculty colloquium on a paper that's already been published. 
Well, it was, it was in pre-publication. It was widely circulated for a year before it came out. There was nothing during that period either. And lots of people knew about it. I mean, it was, it was very I mean, widely known. I don't known. think we've ever... I, I, I don't know how other schools operate, but usually here, when we invite somebody to give a paper at lunch, we have no idea what paper they're going to give before they send in a paper. We don't generally look for papers and invite them to give the papers on the theory that if the paper's being published, we can read it just fine. Uh, I don't think that's the only purpose of faculty colloquy. The, the okay, paper well, was, widely, I mean, here, was widely known about by March of 2004. It didn't appear until January 2005. And not a single top 20 faculty had a colloquium on it. Um, I was strongly urged by a number of colleagues at UCLA and elsewhere that having made the point I made in systemic analysis, it would be harmful for my career to continue to push this point. And if, in fact, I hadn't continued to push it, the whole law school mismatch thing, which we now consider sort of, you know, you're right that it, it has become a kind of a, an issue with legs, but that's only because I continue to push it. No one else was arguing that it should be continued to be pushed. And, uh, and you know, immediately after it appeared, there was a measurable change in law school admissions practices. But when the counterattack came out and sort of the deans consolidated behind the anti-mismatch position, all that disappeared. Um, there has been, as I said, no attempt to create any kind of legal education commission to deal with this issue. There has been fierce resistance and a complete clampdown of any data release on the issue of, of bar passage. You, you talk about the, you know, let's let people decide whether it makes sense to go to school A or school B. But there is no data with which they can decide. They, they can sort of see Sanders' argument, and they can see lots of other non-peer-reviewed articles that say it's wrong. But, but, but there's no data you can find. The the, 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 it, what, what we need is the ability for people to say, like I did on that chart, if with my LSAT, if I go to UCLA, I, my, people in my group have a 31% chance of passing. If I go to school B, I have a 79% chance of passing. That gives people a meaningful chance of actually evaluating this issue. But they know, for example, whether they are within the 25 to 75 range, right? That's, yeah. that's required. Yeah. So the interesting question is, I mean, if you, how, at what point would you give somebody advice that they shouldn't go to UCLA, they should go to, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, the, like Chapman instead or something. At what point would you tell somebody, that's a better bet for you? Well, you know, I, I wrote an article sort of looking at the trade-off of schools in terms of, uh, in terms of employment opportunities and found that it's much, much smaller than we, we tend to think of. The debate, again, tends to be deleted by, uh, dominated by elite schools who think that eliteness is everything. But in fact... People who go to lesser schools and perform well have pretty great careers and have higher chances of achieving certain things like law school, like law firm partnerships. But the point is that, that there has been an organized effort, a very systematic and organized effort to suppress any possibility of information being released, which would make the kind of transparency, the kind of comparisons you're talking about possible. We have, we all know, I mean, the, my research occurred because of something called the Bar Passage Study, which was commissioned in the 1990s. Its purpose was to figure out why are black bar passage rates so low. Um, it, it, you know, the data unambiguously showed that part of that was due simply to different levels of, of uh, academic credentials going in. But the only plausible explanation, the only explanation that's really been advanced at all for the rest of the gap, which is a large gap, is mismatch. Now, we were very concerned about trying to study this issue in the 1990s, but all discussion of this issue ended after my article appeared because most people actually knew that that was the answer. It's proven to be overwhelmingly supported by evidence, but they couldn't go down that path because of political correctness. Uh, I, again, I'm at, I'm at a disadvantage here in having this discussion because you're an empiricist who did empirical work. Right. There are empiricists on the other side who say, I disagree, and I have no and, way... And who refuse to talk to me. Well, but so, I have no way... First of all, I don't know whether they've refused to talk to you or not, okay. but... Well, why don't we investigate no it? Why what? do they want to block the data? The problem with the story you're telling is I don't understand how what you're saying is correct. Anybody would be opposed to getting the data. Well, again, I don't understand in what form the data now are. There was su the, the last, you know, in the press discussion of this, I understood, was in part you can't perturb some of the data enough with some of the schools that have really small numbers of people so that it won't be clear exactly who you're talking about. 
Well, Pam, is there, you know, neighbor, excuse me, also but excuse I, me, but, but again, I but am not. I, I understand you're in a difficult I, position, but those arguments are utterly ridiculous. I mean, I, I don't I know a, whether they're true or false. Well, I can show you the 75-page expert report we prepared, and you I can read it. Okay. Have you actually looked into Let's the issue? Let's go back to with somebody who actually is a specialist in your field, not with somebody who is a doctrinalist. I mean, I can discuss legal doctrine with you, and I feel perfectly comfortable discussing legal doctrine. I don't feel comfortable as the representative of a position on something that I am not expert on. And my point is, those representatives are unwilling to engage the issue. And it, I don't they're, they're, know whether that, I can't even have that discussion with you okay, because I don't. Then I fine, don't then let's consider an unrebutted well, claim let's, by let's, me. Why, why, well, why, he's not on the panel. Well, let's bring Nick in, and maybe, so, uh, maybe one. One problem with this issue that I think Pam is getting at is that, that courts have a very hard time evaluating for the same reasons that non-empirical professors do about you know, what, who's correct on a, on a policy issue like this. But on the sort of issue you're talking about, Rumsfeld versus Fair, for example, the, isn't the ultimate court decision a kind of constraint on how skewed professors can be? So if the concern is the academy, the presentation to students getting sort of skewed in some fashion, why isn't the fact that at the end of the day people have to read the Rumsfeld versus Fair decision a constraint on how far out of line the academy can get in this field? And maybe that, to draw off the earlier discussion, maybe that's a difference between law and some other disciplines. Yeah, I think it's fantastic at the end of the day that the students get to read the <laughs> Rumsfeld v. Fair opinion, but it would have been nice maybe for the students before that to have gotten some signal from some of their professors that some of the arguments on the other side were you know, maybe more plausible and more likely to win in court. So I, I guess I'll say um, I, I quite agree there are, um, th there are reasons to litigate and argue other than trying to win. And it's perfectly plausible to file such a brief knowing that the odds are slim. I wasn't hearing that, though, I mean, just at least at Georgetown. I mean, they, they conveyed to me the sense that like this was a winner of an argument. And they did convey to me surprise at losing 8-0. The, um, then but, they're, they're not no, good lawyers. So, but you know what? What they ought to be able to do is separate these things out. I mean, it would be perfectly fine for a law professor to say, "Look, I think the you know Supreme Court is crazy and wrong about this." But so, so there's my view of what the Constitution ought to say as to this. But let me also explain to you that I'm, at the, I'm on a tiny fringe of the continuum, and the continuum as represented by the US Supreme Court, eight of them are going to disagree with this. So if that was the presentation you were getting, this is my slice, but this is actually the slice out in the world, I think that would be OK, and a student could understand that. But I'd say it often is not presented quite that way. I mean, I think they're presented it as though it is the law, or likely to become the law, or whatever, when in fact, really, it's such a fringe slice that they can't get Justice Stevens or anybody. Well, let me, so before we open it up, but to draw on that and come back to the classroom piece of this, which I think is important. I mean, it seems to me that I mean, political correctness, as Pam was suggesting, is normally a pejorative term. The idea is that you know, some idea is not being tolerated, not for good reasons, but because, but because of some political orthodoxy. But I think if you strip that away, the what I see as the real issue here is, on the one hand, there's a kind of conflicting values in the university. On the one hand, you're, you're, the university is committed to intellectual rigor, law school presenting competing positions, challenging students to question their beliefs. But on the other hand, you're part of a diverse community, and, and, and you want to create an, an, an environment of tolerance and respect where that sort of debate can take place. So I'd love to hear, I mean, I, in teaching in the classroom, for instance, how do you strike the right balance between uh, challenging students' preconceptions, but also, um, at least the way I always think about it, is, is certain debates, particularly in a class like constitutional law, have a kind of personal impact on some students they don't have on others. And so what's the right way to negotiate that sort of boundary? Um, and I'd love to hear from all of you, but yeah. Well, very briefly, I mean, I, I think it's a big issue. I, I, at UCLA, I just, um, I continually partly because I'm identifying with this mismatch issue. I continually get reports from students about not feeling comfortable raising issues. Um, um, usually right of center issues. Um, there's, you know, there are problems of um, 
uh, of microaggressions that uh, that minority students face, but there are there are problems of macroaggressions that are part of the everyday life of the you know conservative experience at UCLA. Um, that there's uh, you know and, and and the school makes no effort to socialize students to the idea that that uh, that that learning can be uncomfortable. They do exactly the opposite. They've actually, in the last three years, UCLA has started a variety of programs, all aimed at trying to <coughs> convince faculty and students that we need to make the learning environment as comfortable as possible, and that we need to pre-censor all sorts of all sorts of ideas and topics and ways of expressing things to try to make sure that we're not making the environment uncomfortable. So the first thing that you need to do is to stop that and get out the opposite message, which is that uh, a good legal education should make you uncomfortable frequently. And there are all sorts of things that people are going to encounter in the real world, and they ought to encounter them in law school. Uh, you know, I actually haven't seen a lot of this firsthand. So I'm, I follow it quite closely, and I'm, um, I see more of it on the, in my work on the board of directors of FIRE. Uh, but in I, I teach structural constitutional law, and honestly, it doesn't come up so much. I mean, I think we're we're not doing um, we're not doing the most politically sensitive issues in that course. So just as you say, I mean, people are not so worked up about the Eleventh Amendment or whatever. Um, so I haven't I don't see it that much in my class, but uh, it, um, it certainly does seem uh, at least from uh, the from the work of FIRE that there is a kind of new campus climate where um, uh, more and more things cannot be said. Well, I mean, I will say, I've, I mean, this is just the naive belief of a new professor, but I've always, I mean, I teach constitutional law and I just try and say explicitly that, you know, we're dealing with sensitive topics that people have different beliefs about and, you know, my goal here is to equip you to best advocate your own beliefs and, I find that students are generally understand that, and 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 so I wonder how much the the climate of fear is really there, and or, or how much how much it comes from the students at least to the extent it's there. But. Yeah, I mean, I try to do exactly the same thing you do, which is in the first five minutes of every course I teach, I say, you know, it'll be clear to you on a lot of these issues what I think, but I welcome hearing other points of view and. Yeah, you know, and I respect hearing them because my job is not to turn you into mini me. I mean, you know, there's nothing I like more than the students I had who are doing exactly the kind of work I did before I went into the academy, and I love seeing them. But I also love seeing the the other ones. I mean, the the ones who are out there defending the indefensible and prosecuting the clearly innocent. No, um, <laughs> the, the ones that the, no, but I mean the ones who take a different a different point of view than I do. I, I'm as ha you know I'm as ha happy with them as I am with the ones that agree with me on agree with me on everything because I view my job as an educator to help students I mean that's the word education is like leading things out of people that's all that are already in there so I'm not trying to make people agree with my view of the Constitution let alone my political commitments but. You know, I do think there are, you know, there are there are some people who I just don't understand. I think they exacerbate the problem by suggesting there's a bigger problem than there is. So they suggest, you know, we can't talk about this issue in class because it's so fraught. And any time I heard, hear the word fraught, I worry because it seems like one of those very jargony words. Um, you know, this issue is very fraught. I always thought fraught had to take a prepositional phrase afterwards. And if there's no prepositional phrase afterwards, it's a very bad sign. Um, and so I try to think there are, no, there are no legal issues relevant to the course that can't be discussed in the room. Um, and the more you make sure that students feel that their views are being respected and that you're trying to teach them rather than trying to force them to agree with you, the less likely you are to have, to have those problems. But you have to model for the students the idea that you can talk about these issues with people you disagree with um, in a respectful but forceful way. Um, but I do agree, you're trying to teach them in the classroom something about how to deal with, with the outside world um, mm -hmm. rather than making them feel, you know, that they can't discuss really important legal issues. 
All right, well, why don't we open it up if there are any questions from the audience now. I'm such a loser. <laughs> <laughs> bring in, bring in the Batsy. <laughs> So one of the weirdest things about being a law professor is the thing that we do that is most private, that is sitting in our offices and writing articles, there's lots of public discussion with our colleagues about. The thing we do that's most public, which is teaching students, I have very little idea what goes on in other people's classrooms. Um, I, I just came back, as you know, from spending um, a, a couple of months teaching Stanford undergraduates in Italy. And so I was in classrooms for the first time as a student. I was taking Italian, uh, and I was taking history of art. And seeing other people teach after teaching for so many years is a real revelation. So I don't know what goes on in other people's classrooms. I, I tend to think that lots of people are not very interested in hearing what students have to say and have a particular view of the law. I'm not sure that's correlated in any way with what their ideology is. That is, there are people probably across the spectrum who are very open to the discussion and people who are very closed. I, I wish law school spent more time as faculties talking about pedagogy and teaching, because I think it actually would be useful. You find out all of these techniques and things when you talk to other people if you, if you get the chance to talk to them, that you can then bring into your classroom that work really well. So, um, you know, I, I, I agree with you that there, there can be that problem. Um, and, and just anecdotally, one of the, the classes I taught that I enjoyed most was a couple of, a couple of, this is now maybe a dozen years ago, I was back at the University of Virginia teaching and I was teaching the voting rights class, and Justice Thomas came down for three days to visit. And they said, would you let him like come and teach your class with you for a day? And I said, sure. And they said, he's willing to talk about anything. Um, you know. And, it, and so I felt, well, maybe we should talk about the RV. But um, you know, he drives around the country in an RV in the summers. But instead, I said, what would you have done if you had been on the Supreme Court in 1962 when they decided Baker against Carr and in 1964 when they came out with one person, one vote? And it was a great opportunity to discuss these issues in the class. And he was, you know, he was very lively about it. And at the end of it, he said something that comes very close to a little bit of what he did in Evanwell this past this past week, which is he said, you know, I'm all for the idea of one person, one vote, but I just don't see it anywhere in the Constitution. And so it was a great opportunity for the students to see, you know, disagreements. Um, and at the end, I, I said, well, something about the Voting Rights Act. He said, well, you know, I cited you in my concurrence. I said, yeah, you cited me as an example of if we don't cut back on the Voting Rights Act, look at the crazy stuff people will do. He said, but I said it with respect. 
Uh, so I think, you know, modeling that kind of, you know, these are difficult issues and we'll write about them and talk about them and debate them is an important thing to do. So, uh, so I'm sorry to hear that you haven't had that experience in other classes, but boy, I never get to see other people teach unless I'm co-teaching with them. I, I guess just to add to that, so I, I, um, I, you say that there, there probably is this pathology in the world, some professors who yeah. you know, behave in this way, and you don't think it's necessarily correlated with politics, and I agree with you about that, but you have to, we have to couple that with yeah. the numbers. So yeah. it's a pathology that doesn't correlate with politics, but because 90x percent of the faculty is liberal, it's a pathology. 90% of the path pathologicals oh, yeah. are liberal, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No question. No question. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'd like to uh, uh, echo the last comments about uh, <coughs> open-mindedness, but uh, and I hadn't planned to ask another question, but the exchange with Rick um, really uh, uh, thought I really sh should uh, comment. Um, students, and I'm uh, talking to my students uh, at Northwestern, they have no idea of the extent of the preference. They are not making uh, a knowledgeable choice in that. And they have no idea. I've done bar passage studies for two law schools, one about 75th and one about 150th on the hierarchy. And the students have no idea how incompetent the admissions groups are at their law schools and how much they're driven by uh, wishful thinking. At one of the law schools, they had net, they were admitting students with a with an LSAT that no one at that school had ever passed the bar ever because I had data for when that that scheme when they went to the 48 point no one had ever passed the bar from that now if you told the student you might if you graduate um, be able to take the bar but your odds of passing you know are close are pretty pretty low I actually recommended to both schools that they tell people who are in the bottom quarter of admittees, your chance of passing the bar is whatever, 17%, 20%, whatever we computed it to be. And that they also make it available to the admissions people because you're allowed multiple uh, 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 equations so the people admitting can say, oh, this, you know, this person actually has this. And I suggested, look, it, you can take as many minorities as you want, but at least pick the ones that have some chance of passing the bar. Now, as far as getting, uh, getting data, uh, uh, you mentioned faculty colloquium. When I was doing Arming America, I was invited to at least a dozen faculty colloquium in the year, and it was draft. Harvard, Yale, Columbia, uh, Berkeley, UCLA. I don't think Stanford. Um, we don't have. Uh, but, yeah, you may I not. Mean, you know, we, we just don't I'm have trying this to remember. I certainly don't remember <laughs> coming. But, uh, you know, most of the major law schools had me through to talk about it, and it wasn't, you know, uh, uh, it involved guns, so it wasn't that they were that hostile. But I think this is an issue in which is viewed as much, much more, they're much more concerned about. And as far as getting data, in the 1990s, they did a, they did a study. They collected data from 170 some law schools. And they said they'd give us the data afterwards. And I thought, great, you know, I can finally find out what, where's the critical mass? What works? You know, is it schools that reach a lot, re reach, reach and, and get people with different credentials? Does that work? Because then they have more. They released the data in virtually unusable form in which you couldn't do anything with it. And they said it was because of, uh, because of uh, confidentiality, privacy. I said, look. I'll get a dedicated computer. I will work only in your office. You can look at every output I take. I will take nothing. If privacy is a concern, you have zero concern because I will never have access to the data outside your offices, never take a key drive out, nothing. Still no data. Finally, with that data, they destroyed the data. And I've checked. I, I talked to the people who run it. They destroyed the data because they're concerned that someone might at some point figure out what was going on with it. And it would have been easy to just group by LSATs if they needed to group. People with 38, schools with 38 LSATs, 39. And if there weren't enough schools, you know, uh, combine a few. And just the ALS, they released data to Tracy George and Albert Yoon. They won't release it to anyone else. They've refused, again, the same issues of we'll go to a private place, dedicated computer, no privacy concerns. Privacy concerns are a pretext. They are absolutely dishonest, as Rick said, and, and you should not take any of those concerns seriously. If they have privacy concerns, they can all be worked out. They don't want to work them out. They're not interested in people analyzing the data. I'll just, I'll just say, you know, we, we routinely release databases uh, on, for example, health outcomes, mental illness, criminal records, uh, uh, HIV, you know, a huge amount of epidemiological research requires 
the release of the use of large data sets. And we, you know, we have agencies engage in the process of figuring out how do we balance risk of disclosure against utility of data. That, that you know, so, so that this operates in all sorts of realms. The, the issues involved in the bar data are so trivial compared to issues that we routinely solve in far more sensitive areas that it, it, it really does undermine the, the, the claim. Moreover, our, our initial proposal to the bar was that they not release any data. We just wanted them to study the issue. And that was a specific thing that was voted down in our initial proposal. I want, yeah. Well, that's, that's a lot. I want to give other people a chance to ask questions. But briefly, um, the, I don't think schools are, I don't think ambitions committees generally are looking for homogeneity. I think they're looking for heterogeneity. They give a lot, a lot of weight to diversity. And, uh, and students with wide range of backgrounds and preparation do get admitted. Um, as Jim says, a lot of the problem is that the ambitions uh, folks are not connected to outcome research. So they don't, they don't even think critically about uh, what they're doing. And there's no transparency so that people can't critically compare different admissions offers they have. Um, one notable anecdote is, is uh, there's, a, there's a program in Southern California specifically aimed and, and funded by a foundation to try to, try to help uh, black and Hispanic students become scientists. And uh, the, the executive director of that program read my book after it came out. And it occurred to him that all the, during the 10 years he'd been running the program, he had been always viewing it as a triumph if students got admitted to a very elite school. Um, the more elite, the better. So he went back and, and he, he started tracking down all the career histories of the, of the alumni of the program. And he found that out of 102 people that, that had been in the program, none had entered a doctorate program in the sciences. One had entered medical, medical school. And when he looked further, he saw that to the extent that they were having successful careers in some science-related field, it was very closely connected with the degree to which they had avoided mismatch. So he's changed his program. But it's an example of how folks really don't know this unless they, they kind of make a special effort to inquire and unless they have access to data that lets them look at it. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, Professor Rosenkrantz, I was interested in your comment about the connection between law school hiring and um, methodology that professors use. Um, Sarah Losky, as I'm sure you know, has kept the stats on at least entry-level hiring for a number of years. And what we know is that at least at the entry level, um, it's very difficult to get hired if you do, for example, qualitative work, particularly ethnography. If you have a PhD in econ, you're vastly more likely to get hired than if you have a PhD in sociology. And of course, that sort of maps onto politics and sort of not, sort of maps onto methodology and sort of not. I guess my question is, what what responsibility you think we have in the academy, specifically the legal academy, to ensure certain kinds of methodological diversity and the implications you think that has? And I guess, Professor Carlin, I'd be curious on your thoughts about this as well. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And a, a, I think it's a great question, very important question, a very difficult question. I think it's, uh, it's related to um, Larry Kramer's comments on the last uh, panel. Um, he makes the important point it's actually really difficult to disaggregate our criteria of quality from our views about methodology and about um, kind of the right answer. So, you know, he's, if this were physics, it would be easy to say, look, choose the best physicist. You shouldn't care about race. You shouldn't care about gender. You shouldn't care about politics. You know, the person who's doing the best work. But it's actually hard to say to a law professor, you know, find us the best you know, the best other legal academic, t setting aside your view of the right way to think about the law. It's actually, it's a kind of a hard question to ask. I mean, so, that's, um, so you know, the, uh, there's a sense in which this is discrimination, but, you know, there's a sense in which this does blur into people's legitimate, bona fide assessment of quality, and they're tough, actually, to disaggregate. So I think it's actually a difficult problem. I mean, um, my colleague Mike Seidman puts the point rather provocatively. He says, um, look, you know, nobody complains that the astronomy department here at Georgetown doesn't have any astrologers, right? We don't do that. They're just, that they're, uh, that they're wrong. And so we should have zero, and that's the right number to have. And that's the way he feels about originalists. Like, he thinks that's the same. And moreover, you know, if you say to him, well, but set that aside and just find, who do you think would be the best originalist? He says, it's a nonsensical question. It's like, ask me to find the best astrologer. They're all, it's, none of it makes any sense. <laughs> that's, that's literally his view about originalism. I, I don't know quite how to answer that. I don't know quite what to say to him about that. But that's, and I don't know how common that view is. But. We're looking for best in breed, not best hmm. in show. Hmm. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I think in part because I'm very old school on what law schools are relative to, I, I mean, I feel more and more old school relative to uh, where law schools are going. Then a lot of law schools are now trying to become like mini universities um, or little Noah's Arks. You know, we need two of this and two of that. The thing about economics, I can't remember what conference I was at um, where I think it was Roger Knoll was speaking, and he talked about the kind of imperialism of a, a economics across a wide range of different areas. So political science has now become a sort of mini economics. And there are parts of sociology, as you know, that are a mini economics. And the thing about the mini economist is it's almost like Mad Libs. They can just generate endless numbers of papers. Um, and to the extent that a faculty becomes risk averse at the entry level about what people are going to write, you know that somebody who has this very, what I think of as n not necessarily very interesting methodology will generate huge numbers of papers. They're not going to go down a lot of rabbit holes. Whereas, you know, if you had started your work on the Lou Henkin paper that you say he got totally wrong and you had discovered after spending three years going through all the primary sources that Lou Henkin was right, and you were an untenured faculty member, your school would be very depressed, right? Whereas if you're one of the people who does the let's explain the efficiency of this or the inefficiency of that, you know that person's going to generate a lot of work. And I think that may be more of what's driving this than anything about than anything conscious about the methodology is these people have a lot of papers. And you know they're going to produce a lot more of the same. So if it's kind of okay now five or six years in, it's going to be kind of OK then. But that may, <coughs> I think that of that as a kind of fundamental 
small c conservatism of the legal academy that you're trying to hire safely at the entry level market a lot of the time and so if you've seen people do this kind of work in the past you're going to be happy to hire another person who does this kind of work because you know it turns into something that's going to be tenurable at the back end and you know this is why they generally say in law schools don't like be writing a book as an untenured faculty member because if you spend three or four or five years on something and it, it doesn't turn out to really pan out you're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. If you wanted to get the well, safe strategy on the James Phillips data, you'd hire the conservative who publishes at a rate of one article per year more than the liberal, apparently. I, I wasn't right. here for this, but yeah. it sounds. All right. Well, uh, I'd love to hear more from all our panelists, but I'm afraid we're over time. So why don't you all join me in thanking them for the next one? <laughs>